the discussion now seems to hinge upon a couple of key points. Um, the first of the, the first of them I find seems to be the idea that there are smart and stupid ways to act, or smart and stupid ways to think. Not so sure about that. Um, since there's only experience and smartness, only seems to be in the realm of identifying things uh, in terms of what you want or what you don't want. It doesn't seem there doesn't seem to be anything absolute in terms of uh, an intelligent or an unintelligent thing to do. Um, it's all based on what your premises are, right? You say, okay, it's unintelligent for you to deliberately stick your hand into the fire. Unless, of course, you don't know what fire is. Now you stick your hand into the fire, your, your hand is burned all to hell. Um, is it still an unintelligent thing that you did? Because you've learned an awful lot, haven't you? Other people who have witnessed you do that have done. A, have learned a lot. Um, you've at least learned what not to do next time. But have you really learned anything? Have you really, you know, have you really um, exhibited intelligent behavior? Was that it ultimately, at the end of the day, was that an intelligent or a not intelligent thing to do? Well, in some ways it was intelligent, in some ways it wasn't very intelligent. You didn't have to stick your hand into the fire to see that it's going to damage what you put in the fire. You can put something else in and watch it get burned to a cinder. You don't have to stick your hand in there. But by the same token, you can learn things from burning, th burning your hand in the fire. So it is, and it isn't intelligent. Anything works that way. You can come up with any intelligent sort of conclusion from any act and any stupid conclusion from any act. You can say that was a smart move, that was a stupid move. Um, you know, it's all just a question of playing the odds, right? You can say, okay, it's stupid to walk into a bank with a pea shooter and say, give me all your money, unless, of course, you fully understand the odds of it coming off and you accept them. Um, you know, you might not be interested in living outside of prison any longer that kind of thing. You, th there's any number of ways you can spin anything. Um, people do all kinds of stuff which just doesn't seem to make sense to other people because they're not in that person's head. Um, the whole idea of intelligence fascinates me and I, I sort of originally explored it elsewhere um, on YouTube uh, in a discussion on race realism where these people have taken IQs and have applied uh, IQ testing and the results and um, use that to gauge intelligence. Well, my counter to that is, what's intelligence? Does an IQ test really measure intelligence? You're going to have to tell me what intelligence is before you can measure it. Um, what is an intelligent thing to do? It all depends on what you think an intelligent outcome is, I suppose, or, or it all depends on what you want intelligence to do. Um, given our mortality and the fact that futility is built into existence itself, apparently, i.e. we are mortal, and it looks as though the universe itself is mortal, what really is an intelligent versus a non-intelligent move? You have to sort of have some givens in there. You know, it, it, it's it's desirable to continue to exist. It's desirable to exist in a certain degree of comfort. It is desirable to have a certain degree of security. Now, that's these are all assumptions. Um, but we have, you know, the we have all kinds of counter counters to that. We know that material possessions don't necessarily make you feel sufficient. We know that security is illusory because we live in a completely um, unpredictable universe. We think we can hedge our bets against one thing, but what we, one thing we can't hedge our bets against is non-existence, or death even. I shouldn't even say non-existence, but we can't hedge our bets against that. Transhumanists say so, okay, then that just postpones it a bit longer because eventually we'll be in a situation of entropy when the universe will wind down, if not in this hundred billion eons, then in the next hundred billion eons. Uh, uh, 
numbers become meaningless in the face of simple brute existence. Um, <clears throat> So I'm not really sure that there is such a thing as an, uh, an intelligent or a stupid thing to do. Now, you sort of think, okay, well, you just, you've just thrown the entire enlightenment down the sink. Yes, I have. You know, it, at the end of the day, has the, has the enlightenment really made our situation as humans any different from what it's always been? We're always, we've always been stuck with the same questions. What am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going? The enlightenment hasn't even come any closer than any, any other explanation to answer these questions. Not at all. You can say that it's better than religion. Well, that depends on what you mean by religion, because if you believe religion as, an act, as a mythology, okay, I understand that. Other, but people see science as a mythology. People see Darwin and natural selection as a mythology. They think it's like your couple of turn of phrases in the previous video, um, Gary, you said... Um, this isn't designed to do this. Well, it's not designed to do anything. Nature doesn't design anything. Nature just sort of happens. It um, There's no intent behind any of it, and this is how people can mythologize natural selection. Um, so it's just, a lot of people have just taken, instead of the book of Genesis and the Christian theology as their myth for existence, they've just tacked it onto Darwin, thinking that Darwin actually is another mythology. Um, so, you know, I, or if you read religious things sort of in a different way, if you sort of assume that it's reasonably um, well thought out, then you sort of go, okay, maybe these people are talking in parables here, which is how I generally read all religious texts. Um, it's just, you know, you, you can't, there are certain truths that are difficult to explain using our language, so you have to come at them parabolically, i.e. you have to use parables. So that's what you use to... to to describe things. So I'm not really sure that the Enlightenment really has the element of progress in it that people seem to think that it is, because all, all that you've done is you've solved one set of problems with another set of postulates, and you know, you sort of, you just replaced the one with the other. You haven't really gone anywhere with it, because the same basic problems remain. You use the example of drunk driving. Okay, mother's against drunk driving. You want to stop drunk driving. Okay, really, you want to stop drunk driving. Um, you can do that, sure, but the assumption is that stopping drunk driving is somehow going to improve the human condition. Well, that assumes that the human condition is improvable, and it somehow assumes that stopping drunk driving will concretely improve the human condition, i.e., the human condition will be concretely better than it was before we stopped drunk driving. I think that that's something that has yet to be demonstrated. Um, you might stop drunk driving, okay, a few random acts that happen might not happen as a result of that, but other random acts could happen. And, you know, again, that's the nature of randomness, right? Maybe the, f the fewer drunk drivers there are on the road, the fewer accidents I'm going to get into, but maybe, I'm, maybe other people are going to drive less carefully knowing that there are fewer drunk drivers out there. It's like the moral issue of drunk driving. I get behind the wheel of my car and I drive to work today and I get T-boned by a drunk driver at 6 a.m. and I sort of go, this was horrible that this happened to me, but a little voice in the back of my head says, look, you knew there were drunk drivers out there and you got on the got on the road anyway. So, you know, do I really have, is it really a moral issue here that I just got put in a wheelchair or something? No, I knew that that was a risk, getting behind the wheel of the car. Um, now we have distracted driving, people driving with their cell phones or whatever device, you know, taking their attention away and the, you know, driving, you know, uh, I haven't looked at the stats, but I wouldn't be surprised if everyday life is just as dangerous as it's always been. I think the ultimate aim of Mothers Against Drunk Driving is not to actually stop drunk driving. I think the unstated aim is that they're going to reduce the amount of people who are harmed. That's not going to happen. I'd like to see anybody claim that they've ever reduced harm, ever. You might reduce cancer, but another harm is right there to counterbalance all of it. Um, and the ultimate harm, death or non-existence of the universe, or at least the winding down of the universe, is there anyway to undo any undoing of anything. So, I don't really, th I'm not really sure that we can claim absolutely that we're making progress. 
Um, I'm certainly not one to tell people, wait for a hundred years and life will be so much better. I don't believe that. I don't think it'll be any worse. It'll simply be a different set of circumstances that, we, that each of us has to sort of deal with. That's all. It's just necessity. That's all. Uh, you know, you, you, you're, you're not going to end necessity. Um, what must happen is what must happen. You know, um, it, it's not something that you can actually do anything about, or it isn't necessity. So, no, I, I'm not sure that I agree with the idea of progress. Um, I don't want to go back 200 years to, you know, or 2,000 years or 10,000 years to live in some state of nature or whatever. Um, not because I don't think uh, I don't want to. Not because I think that their lives are any worse. But because if it was me going back there, I'm I'm a product of the present age. I wouldn't fit in back there. That's the only reason why. If you sort of showed somebody from 10,000 years ago, they want to come and live here, sit in my desk, talk into the webcam, and watch what's happening, they'd probably be horrified by that as well. They don't want to live here either. They don't want to live in my world. I don't want to live in their world. That doesn't mean that one is better or worse than the other. Um, they simply wouldn't understand it. I wouldn't understand their universe. That's all. I wouldn't like it. They wouldn't like mine. It doesn't make one or the other better. It's just a question of appetite. Um, so progress, I'm not so sure about, nor am I sure of intelligence. The race realists would take our idea that intelligence even exists, and they'd push it to sort of weird extremes, and what that tells me is some people can't be trusted to play nice with axioms. Um, you know, you give some people a place to stand and look what they'll build on it. Just the idea that intelligence exists ends up being something along the lines of, I don't know, racialism or whatever. It is racialism. Um, by the same token, if you sort of say that progress exists, then you also get the idea of evolution is going from low to high, which I don't think it is. It's simply an e the eternal moment of becoming. I don't think that I'm more evolved than... Uh, an Australopithecus or whatever my ancestor is. I don't think that at all. He just had a different set of circumstances to exist in. A different necessity. Mine's different than his. That's all. Um, he's, he wasn't evolving towards something. Neither am I. And I'm not evolving away from something. Things aren't getting better. They aren't getting worse. It's just a different set of circumstances. Now, I understand where, that this sort of argumentation annoys people, but what can you do when you see that, that people are looking at things from this big of a perspective when you're placing value on um, existence itself? And if you're positing the view that you can actually prevent existence, or you know, you can actually stop sentience, or stop life, okay, that's a pretty darn big assumption, and I'm going to sort of say, okay, I'm going to go up there into the stratosphere and look down from equal heights or perhaps even a higher position, and say, is that even a reasonable thing? There's always a higher and higher or different vantage point that you can take, and things look, start to look a bit wimpy after a while. As I say, Benatar just sort of gerrymandered the whole thing from the, from the beginning. He said, it's better never to have been because there's before, and then there's during existence. He just didn't deal with the after of existence business. No matter how bad your existence is, omnia transient, you're... All, all that you were is going to be abolished. All your suffering, everything, gone. And, and as I always say, better never to have been becomes may as well never have been. Um, at the end of the day, what's the difference? 